I should start by saying um, no, I'm very grateful for this opportunity to get a chance to present some of the work that we've been doing on the country study on India uh, over the past, I guess, year or so. Uh, the work is still underway, so I'm very grateful and looking forward to getting uh, comments and suggestions from you all. I should also say I'm quite miserable about making this presentation because I normally go way over time when I present a single paper and now I'm supposed to summarize five different papers and I'm supposed to do all of that within 20 minutes. So I'm, I'm, it's just uh, it's really painful, but um, it's, a, it's a really nice opportunity. And let me start by saying, um, so the kind of context within which uh, uh, this presentation is going to be is sort of starting from the point of view or from the perspective that, well, inequality in India is a topic that's actually currently under quite a lot of discussion and debate. It gets, it gets a lot of attention, uh, not just in India, uh, but also uh, around the world, uh, not least because of a number of very kind of big splash publications that have come out recently. There's a paper by Sean Sadam Piketty that sort of documents Indian uh, inequality over a very long period of time since the early 1920s. Uh, it is entitled uh, Inequality in India from British Raj to Billionaire Raj uh, and documents uh, this very rapid and, and uh, extraordinary uh, uh, increase in inequality uh, uh, over this time period. Uh, another book that was recently published uh, by James Crabb Tree, for, uh, who's a columnist with the Financial Times, um, called The Billionaire Raj, talks a lot about uh, 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 what's going on in India and focuses, like the Chancel and Piketty book, uh, very much on what's going on at the very top end of the income distribution and documents this really rapid accumulation of enormous wealth uh, amongst the very top of the income segments in India. And so that's the main contention of these papers and also the subject of quite a lot of this debate, which is around the, the economic growth in India has been high, noticed to have been <coughs> rising uh, and been very, at very high levels uh, in recent years. Um, and these publications are coming out and suggesting that this has been associated with a very, very significant concentration of, of wealth at the very top end of the income distribution. Um, there are Skeptics, uh, these, these views are not entirely endorsed by everyone. An example here is a recent uh, article by Surjit Bala, uh, quite an influential columnist in, in India, who claims that there's no evidence that India has experienced an above average increase in inequality. Uh, so this is still a bit debate, uh, uh, but it's such a, certainly something that's put Indian inequality on the sort of uh, uh, on the map and sort of in the, in the public domain. And what we're trying to do with this project is to complement this uh, 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 this activity, this research, by asking a number of additional questions that haven't perhaps uh, 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 been posed in, or answered in these in these uh, publications I referred to. The, the first one is, 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 is this consensus of inequality being high? Is there, is there additional evidence that corroborates uh, some of these views? Or is this something that uh, is just coming out of, of these individual studies? Um, there is certainly no question that India has achieved significant poverty reduction in recent years. And so the question is, is whether there's an analog uh, of change occurring uh, uh, in, in inequality, the, the kind of forces that have been underpinning the poverty decline. What has there been their impact on, on inequality? Um, we're looking at the trends of, of, of inequality uh, in, in other dimensions than just an in income. Um, what's happening in rural areas, what's happening within the country, not just at the national level. Um, and what are some of the patterns of income mobility that we can discern uh, from the recent evidence? So in some sense, this project, I, I guess, and this was not done deliberately, but in some sense it's kind of complementing the discussion of the previous session uh, where Francois Bourguignon was proposing that there's a dashboard of indicators that we should be looking at. We're trying to at least look at some of those uh, uh, items that are on his dashboard, as well as perhaps some that haven't been included in his dashboard, but that perhaps in the context of <coughs> India could also merit attention. So the project consists essentially of six studies at the moment, of which five have more or less been done. They're all in draft form still, um, and one is still very much underway. There's a paper by Professor Himanshu of JNU and Rinku Murgai, who's at the World Bank office in Delhi, which looks, uh, it basically assembles the secondary data uh, uh, and looks closely at all kinds of evidence on what's been happening to inequality in India over time. Um, a second paper is the way by myself and Chris Elbers at the Freie University, where we're looking at inequality and structural change uh, in the context of a single village and trying to see what's going on at the very local level. And I'll try to motivate and justify that uh, a little bit further. 
a paper by Abhirup Mukhopadhyay, who's here, uh, uh, and uh, uh, David Urzanki at the Free University of Amsterdam as well, looks at the spatial decomposition of inequality. We have a paper by myself and Haiyan Dang where we're looking at intragenerational mobility. So we're trying to get at some of these ideas of what's been happening to, to, to mobility over time. Uh, and we have a paper by Roy van der Weyde from the World Bank and um, his co-author uh, Melody V, I believe, who's in Berlin, uh, looking at intergenerational mobility and human capital, looking specifically at education, uh, intergenerational mobility and education. And we have a final paper that's trying to look <coughs> again at the, the kind of findings of the Chancel Piketty study, uh, which is based on methods that are quite complex and somewhat non-transparent and possibly not entirely uh, uh, one one may not necessarily be entirely at ease with all of the assumptions that underpins it. Um, so we're looking at the same question of what's been happening at the top incomes uh, in India, but based on a different methodology, one that involves uh, uh, looking at house price data to try to fill in the gap of what's going on at the top end of the consumption distribution. And that's being carried out by um, Gerton Rongen, who's also at the Free University in the Netherlands. So this is, uh, I suspect that this may not be legible to, to you all, but this is kind of a, the way I see these five papers filling together with the paper by uh, uh, Himanshu and, and Rinku sort of giving the big picture of what's been going on in India with respect to inequality based on whatever available evidence we can put together, wealth data, earnings data, income data, consumption data, uh, uh, non-income dimensions and so on, to try to fill in as much as we can from the available evidence. And to it's very important uh, also to look at trends. So we're not just trying to get a snapshot of what's going on in India at the moment, but also to document how things have been changing in this particular paper since the early 1980s. The second paper by myself and Chris Elbers looks at this, you know, it goes from the big picture to the very, very micro uh, picture to try to isolate and identify some of the things that are going on in, at, the, at the local village level. We then turn on the lower left-hand uh, side to the paper uh, uh, by Abhirup and uh, uh, and David, which looks at uh, spatial decomposition of inequality. We try to basically unpack inequality, asking the question of whether it's really that compelling to only look at inequality at the level of India as a whole, or should we be trying to look at inequality also at the level below the, the, the country level? And motivated by the analysis of the village in India, we basically try to look at the importance of village level inequality within India as a whole in this particular paper. Uh, the Dang and Lanyao paper looks at intragenerational mobility, as I said, but tries to employ, given the fact that we don't have the kind of panel data that are necessary to do this kind of analysis properly, we try to get around that by invoking or employing some, some, some sort of approximate methods of constructing uh, synthetic panels to try to get at some of these mobility questions. And then the final paper by Roy van der Weyde and his co-author is looking at intergenerational mobility and documents that in India, intergenerational educational mobility is currently, in international terms, very low, but there is a positive uh, sign of improving uh, or increasing intergenerational mobility. So turning to the Himanshu, uh, I'll try to give you just a, a feel for some of the findings that are coming out of these papers. The Himanshu and Murugai paper uh, summarizes this uh, fairly large literature on inequality in India and document the evidence from a variety of, of different sources. And they generally point to, indeed, uh, inequality rising in India. Uh, um, and they illustrate this sort of sectoral transformation that's occurring in India uh, uh, of, of a move away or out of agriculture, that sort of declining importance of agriculture in the Indian economy towards the sort of non-agricultural sector and distinguishing also between the sort of formal and the informal sector uh, uh, as being important parts of understanding the puzzle of inequality in India. So here's a, a picture uh, that is extracted from their paper documenting uh, an increase in inequality. It's not a dramatic increase in inequality, and this is based on consumption data, which is sort of the bedrock of data that, uh, uh, that people have been looked at, looking at uh, 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 in terms of inequality and poverty in India. It's coming from the national sample surveys, and it's for the, the various rounds of national sample survey data starting in 1983 and extending up to 2012. Um, so there's a, they document uh, two important things. One is that indeed in recent decades, so the last say decade or 10, 15 years, inequality has been rising with some leveling off perhaps in the most recent period. But there was also an important period of declining 
uh, inequality in the very early uh, uh, years of this of this <coughs> series of, of cross-sectional data. So inequality actually declined somewhat during the 1980s and the early 1990s, which is important because it means that it's not necessarily inevitable that with economic growth, we should be seeing economic uh, inequality rising, as something that Martin has already pointed to uh, uh, earlier that it can rise with economic growth, but it needn't rise. And in, in India, the experience of the early uh, of the 1980s was that inequality actually very slightly, but did actually decline over this time period, particularly in rural areas. The incidence of growth is sort of captured uh, is captures this as well in the in the pictures on the right hand side here. When we look at Indicators other than consumption, which has been sort of the mainstream indicators of inequality uh, or data that have been used uh, to understand inequality, we can look at, at income inequality. And there are very few good data sets that capture <coughs> overall total income in India, but there is one uh, survey called the IHDS, the Human Development Survey uh, uh, in India which uh, was collected in two periods, in 2004 and then again in 2011. And those data uh, uh, can be used to look at income inequality. And they suggest that income inequality is, in terms of levels, at a much higher level than what we typically see with consumption inequality. Um, and that they also document some increase in inequality over time. It's not dramatic during this time period between 2004 and 2011. The consumption data also suggests it's not been dramatic during that time period with most of the increase in inequality actually occurring before 2004. Um, curiously, in the income data, the suggestion is that inequality in urban areas is lower than in, the, uh, uh, than in rural areas. This is not supported by the consumption data where you look at urban and rural uh, inequality. So there's some, some, some issues there of comparability and so on. But the general trend of rising inequality is supported <coughs> and income inequality levels seem to certainly be considerably higher than the consumption inequality measures that we have. Wealth inequality is something that uh, can be looked at. It has been looked at uh, in the right-hand corner. We see the picture that's taken from the Chancel Piketty studies, which documents an increase in uh, uh, quite a significant increase in inequality in recent decades, and and and, and to the point that the, the the levels of top income inequality nowadays are, are similar to what was uh, 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 the case in the early 1920s. Uh, so it's something that's uh, it's really quite striking. Um, but it's also supported by other data that look at wealth more directly. These All India, uh, uh, the AIDS data, are, have their own problems, are not as complete as one would like, but they do seem to document as well this rising uh, inequality in wealth. Um, we have a very important feature of inequality in India, and this is something that's been long known and long understood, is that there's very important group differences. And uh, a crude way of dividing the Indian population to different groups is either on the basis of caste status or on the basis of sort of religious affiliation. And so these two tables just document that inequality differences uh, between these groups are, are, are very significant and have remained significant over time, with the scheduled tribes and the scheduled castes typically receiving a much smaller fraction of, uh, of, of income than their population uh, uh, share, uh, uh, than their share of the population, whereas uh, the others and the other backward castes and the remaining groups have, uh, have done much better. And similarly, in the case of, uh, uh, of religious affiliation, we see, do see some evidence that the Muslims have a sort of a, a less share of total income than their population would suggest. Um, with a Christian, very small, relatively small Christian population doing particularly well. And this is also something that has certainly not diminished sharply over time. Other indicators of, of, of well-being that are of potential interest, of course, are health, education. We have just here a, a couple pictures. One picture documenting the, the significant higher stunting rates among the scheduled tribes and the scheduled castes. And uh, uh, although there's been some decline, those differences haven't diminished uh, or haven't changed sharply in terms of stunting. And similarly, when you look at dropout rates from school, we see that the scheduled tribes are just much, much more likely to uh, uh, drop out from, say, secondary school uh, in particular, but at all levels of schooling. And the scheduled castes also, certainly in terms of secondary schools, are, are dropping out more than the rest of the population. So that's a, a real whirlwind tour of, of, of a paper that could actually uh, receive a lot more time in, in this presentation. But I want to move on to the uh, Elbers and Lanyao paper, which looks at one village. And the village we're looking at here is a village called Palampur in this province or in the state of Uttar Pradesh. 
And it's been studied very intensively since the late 1950s. So we have a very detailed uh, picture of what's been going on in this one little village uh, since the late 1950s up until 2015. And the big, the big picture there is that we see economic growth has occurred. Uh, we've seen, in terms of big forces of, uh, of change, we've seen green revolution technologies and, uh, 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 and rural non-farm diversification of having exerted a big influence on the village economy. And that's reflected in a declining headcount rate and also an improvement in income mobility. People are moving out of their, their particular income fractiles uh, over time uh, uh, as we go from one year to the next. But we also see, and this is what I would, I, I want to underscore, this is potentially quite important, we see a quite a considerable rise in inequality within the village. And one could ask the question, is that important or not? And I think it's important for multiple reasons. One of them is that it could potentially be one of the reasons that we see people uh, uh, claim that inequality is rising, even though objective information at the, at the country level doesn't necessarily suggest that to be the case. People's reference group might be the less than the country as a whole. It might be a local community. And if inequality in the village is rising, that may well influence how people perceive inequality uh, to be evolving. So their reference group might be the village rather than the country. Another important reason to think about and to take seriously inequality at this very local level is that uh, uh, work we've done work to document that Inequality at the local level has been shaping and has been shaped also by institutional changes in the village level. So things that are going on at the village level are shaped by the inequality at the local level. And if we want to understand what's going on with people and we want to understand their institutional context, their political environment and so on, we need to also understand what's going on with respect to inequality in those villages. A final point to make about inequality in, in, in Palampur, which is potentially of real interest, is that we document rising inequality, falling poverty, but we also document a decline in intergenerational mobility over time. So a father's income is better able to predict a son's income today than it was 25 years ago. And we're able to document these changes in intergenerational mobility because we have data that goes back all the way to the 1950s that covers at least two generations. So we have this insight. It's a, it's a glimmer of a possible I issue of real concern, which is of, with rising inequality, we might be seeing declining mobility of a kind that, that is very closely associated with our ideas of inequality of opportunity and so on. I won't uh, uh, talk further about um, an ongoing work that we're trying to do to explore the possibility that this village is in some sense the kind of forces shaping the income distribution in the village are possibly in some sense more broadly uh, 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 valid but on the basis of sort of simulation work. That's something that's underway. But we have another paper, the paper by Avirup Mukhopadhyay and David Orzainki, which looks explicitly at this question of inequality uh, within villages. And essentially this paper decomposes national level inequality into a between village inequality and a within village inequality component. This is done not with just uh, uh, sort of dry use of existing data because the existing data don't allow us to do such an exercise. And so the, the project involves uh, uh, measuring inequality basically by com uh, at, the, at the village level, um, or measuring average income at the village level by uh, 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 estimating a, an imputation model that relates consumption at the village level against uh, uh, night light intensity data as well as district level variables. And so this, this study uh, uh, pr produces an estimate of average income at the uh, of, for each village of, each of, of India's 600,000 uh, villages. And, and by, because it has an estimate of average income for each village, it is able to sort of back out the between share of uh, between village uh, component of total inequality. And thereby the residual from that ca calculation is the within village component of total inequality. And the evidence suggests that this within village component of inequality is actually a, a very large proportion of total inequality. So if you decompose inequality in this way, you get an a contribution to total inequality from village level inequality of something like 75, 80%. Uh, so much of what was going on in terms of inequality is actually occurring within the village. Uh, and again, a reason to think uh, about what's, so, you know, what's going on at the village. Why, uh, how are these village inequalities influencing all kinds of behaviors and all kinds of, of outcomes? They carry this out at the national level, and then they also carry this out at the state level, and they document that in a very large number of states, the within-village component is actually increasing quite sharply. 
There's an interesting example of the, st uh, the state of Jharkhand here, where overall inequality in Jharkhand is not found, not observed to have changed at all. But within, uh, 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 um, within the state of Jharkhand, we see within village, uh, within village inequality component actually having risen quite sharply. So you can have a, quite a disconnect between your assessment of inequality if you look at the village level inequality or if you look at uh, uh, state level or national level inequality. Turning to the Dang and Lanyao paper, what we do here is uh, basically construct synthetic panels using multiple rounds of NSS data, which are cross-section data, to construct synthetic panels, which then allow us to explore patterns of mobility. Uh, and what we basically observe is that there has been an increase in mobility over time. So if we compare 1993 to 2004, we observe that something like 60% of households are uh, basically still alongside, along the diagonal of this particular type of transition matrix where we distinguish between the poor population, a vulnerable population, and the sort of middle class or secure uh, population. And we document that between 93 to 2004, something like 60% of the population was, 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 was sort of on the diagonal of this transition matrix. Moving to 2004 to 2011, which is actually a somewhat shorter period of time, the actual uh, 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 transitions uh, have, been have, been, have increased. There's a sort of smaller fraction of, of, of the population that's sort of on the diagonal here. So we have greater intragenerational <laughs> mobility that's occurring. And the correlates of this intra intragen intragenerational mobility can be uh, explored, and we tend to find not terribly surprisingly, that factors such as high education, uh, uh, res residence in urban areas, employment in the regular uh, wage sector, and so on, is associated with upward mobility, whereas scheduled tribes, scheduled castes, and certain states, for example, are more likely to be car characteristics that are associated with, with downward mobility over time. Finally, the paper by Roy van der Weyde and, uh, uh, and his co-author, V. Um, we investigate, they investigate intra, uh, intergenerational educational mobility. The income information that would be necessary to, to explore intergenerational income mobility just are not available. And it's not obvious what methods would exist to, to allow us to try to get at that with the existing data sources. But educational mobility can be explored. And this is on the basis of, uh, of information where we look at co-residents of fathers and sons co-residing and looking at their education, their respective education levels. And we, this, this study is based on uh, uh, also on these NSS data going back to the 1980s. And the exercises involves calculating sort of intergenerational regression or correlation coefficients that capture the extent to which uh, education levels persist over time. And the general message from this study is that intergenerational mobility in the educational dimension is actually uh, very low relative to, say, the experience in other countries. And van der Weyde and co-authors at the World Bank have just completed a very exhaustive study of this intergenerational educational mobility, where they're able to look at rates of intergenerational mobility in the education uh, domain across the world. And India comes in as a, as a country where intergenerational mobility really is quite low uh, in, this, in the education uh, dimension. But, and this, uh, this graph shows that there's some evidence of that declining. So that's of that improving. Intergenerational mobility is increasing. Uh, the correlations are actually declining. So that's, a, that's an encouraging sign. One interesting finding from the, from the work that uh, uh, Van der Weyde and co-authors carry out is that they, by employing a, a regional sort of panel that they've constructed with these data, they look at the relationship between intergenerational mobility and growth, and they distinguish between the growth rates of different quintiles in the consumption distribution. And they show that higher inter, or lower intergenerational mobility is associated with lower or bigger declines in growth rates amongst the poor and less of, a, uh, of an impact amongst the growth rates of the, of the rich. And so this suggests that intergenerational mobility is associated with income inequality in the way that we might expect. And that's also reflected in something like the, the Gatsby curve, for example, uh, uh, where, where higher intergenerational mobility is associated with lower inequality and, 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 mm -hmm. and the reverse. Finally, they collect, they carry out some work to try to look at what are the possible correlates of intergenerational mobility. Uh, uh, and they find uh, uh, that public expenditures uh, uh, at the state level, state level public expenditures are associated with higher intergenerational mobility. More political competition, interestingly, is found to be associated with uh, uh, greater mobility. And they also found that 
and this is almost somewhat slightly mechanical, that the percentage of parents with no education is also as positively associated with mobility. But that's possibly something that's uh, somewhat mechanical out of, out of this exercise. Anyway, I'm so sorry for having raced through this, but uh, thank you very much for your attention. <clears throat>